elements to get settled in, to make sure their technology is working correctly, get something to take notes with. Um, note on the sidebar there that you have a chat feature, you have Q&A. We strongly encourage that you use those. You may have come here today with questions that you really are looking to have answered. So please make sure that, you know, put them in there right now before you forget. We will be waiting until the end to go through those questions, um, but we will be sure to address each and every one. So please use that feature. Um, welcome, if you're just joining us, I see some more audience members are signing in. Welcome to our session today, Academic Advising at UConn Stanford. I do wanna share with you as we're giving everyone the opportunity to settle in that if this is your first session with us at UConn Stanford, we offer quite a few. Um, this is not the only one. And so we definitely want to make you aware that there are lots to choose from. And you can find them all right on our main homepage, UConn Stanford. You can then navigate over to admissions. You'll see a drop down that will bring you to visiting campus. And once there, you will see all of our sessions, including academic advising, you'll see our one on one chats, you'll see our information sessions. So we definitely encourage you if this is your first session to check out others. Um, it's a great way to learn more. It's a great way to get your questions answered. So definitely check those out um, and sign yourself up for any that interest you. If you're just joining us, welcome. It's about 4.03. We are going to give it till about 4.05 to get started. We want to make sure that all of our participants have had a chance to log in, um, that they're not experiencing any kind of technical difficulties. So if you're here, you know, just kind of sit tight, make sure that you have something to drink, that you have something to take notes with. There's going to be a lot of really exciting and important information around academic advising specifically. And so you'll want to make sure that you are taking notes so that you get all of those important pointers. Um, the other thing to note, if you are just joining, again, welcome. On the side, you'll see that there's a chat feature as well as a Q&A. And we definitely encourage you to use those features throughout the presentation today. If there are questions that you've come here with, um, you know, that you've been looking to have answered, please put them in there right now so that you don't forget. If, as Jen is presenting, other questions come up or you would like further clarification on something that she has shared, definitely use those two features. Um, we will be waiting until the very end to address each of them, uh, but we will be going through each and every question. So please, you know, use those features and make sure that you get all of your questions in there. I see some other uh, audience members are joining. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us on this beautiful sunny Tuesday. We appreciate you taking the time out of your busy day to be with us and to learn more about academic advising at UConn Stanford. It is such an important area and definitely there's so much information to be learned. And so we're excited. Jen is excited to share all of that with you today. Um, so just a little bit more wait time. I do, we have a large audience expected today. And so I do wanna make sure that everyone has a chance to get settled in before we jump in so that nobody is missing a huge chunk of our presentation. Um, if you are having any kind of technical difficulty, we do advise just logging out and coming back in, perhaps in a different browser, um, changing your um, technology that you're using. If you're on a phone or an iPad, maybe try your laptop, but um, that should alleviate any of the technical glitches if you are having any. So it is 4.05. Um, I know in the interest of everyone's time, we definitely do want to get started. Uh, no further delay. So again, um, audience members, welcome to Academic Advising at UConn Stanford. We are thrilled that you are joining us today. We know that there are many ways that you could be using your time, and we're really excited that you're choosing to use your time to learn more. Um, Jen is going to be leading our session today. She has so much information to share with you um, and is, you know, ready and able to answer any and all questions that you have after. So please put them all in. Jen, you know, if you would introduce yourself to us and then take it away and we'll do Q&A at the end, everyone. Absolutely. Thank you, Caitlin. Uh, my name is Jennifer Tustin. I'm the Assistant Director for Academic Advising at UConn Stanford. I am approaching my ninth year at UConn, so I'm very excited to, to continue working especially over the summer with all our newly admitted students. So I'm hoping that I'll be working with some of you over the summer, or if you're still learning and deciding about UConn, hopefully this presentation can give you some of the information you need to help you make your decision. Um, this afternoon, just gonna be going over some basic information regarding academic policies and procedures at UConn, talking about academic advising and what you can expect during your first semester um, and your academic career at UConn. 
So the first thing that I like to introduce our new students to is the idea that UConn is made up of different schools and colleges. And that's kind of a weird concept to wrap your mind around when you're thinking like UConn is a school, it, it is a college, what do you mean? Every major at UConn belongs to one of our schools or colleges. So for example, School of Engineering, School of Pharmacy, NEAG School of Education. And within each of these schools or colleges lies the responsibilities, the requirements, the courses that students need to take in order to graduate with a degree from that particular school. So, for example, you are thinking about doing psychology. Psychology is part of our biggest college, which is the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, or CLAS, as we refer to it. You're thinking about computer science. Computer science belongs to the School of Engineering. Maybe you want to do elementary education, so you would belong to the NEAG School of Education. Why it's important to note the school or college um, you belong to or that your major belongs to is because, again, each school or college has different requirements for students to meet in order to graduate. If you are an ACES student, you've been admitted as an ACES student, or you are um, exploring, you're undecided, ACES is the place for you. So we work primarily with students who are just that, undecided, exploring. Maybe you're pursuing a professional program like business or um, pharmacy, engineering, you know, things that you will not be admitted to right from the beginning. We work with students to take the courses that are needed to make sure that you can apply to those academic programs down the line. Um, you will see on this slide that there are a number of majors that are highlighted in red. Those are the majors that can be completed in full on the Stanford campus. So if you're looking to start at Stanford and finish at Stanford, then those are the majors that you would want to be pursuing or exploring. Otherwise, many of our students will start their academic journey at UConn Stanford and then campus change to um, another regional campus or our main campus at stores at some point in their academic career. So another important resource I like to introduce um, our students to right from the beginning is the undergraduate catalog. So back in the day when I first started at UConn, <laughs> I'm dating myself now, but if you remember phone books, <laughs> there actually were books where you had to look up people's phone numbers. I know I'm older than all of you, um, but we used to have a course catalog that looks like a giant phone book. And this book held every important bit of academic information that you could ever want to know. Every major, every minor, every school or college, how things are graded, um, fees, resources, you name it, that information was included in the catalog. Because we know things are constantly changing and constantly evolving, the catalog now belongs online. So catalog.ucon.edu is going to be the resource that you will refer to when you have any kinds of questions about credits, placement exams, degree requirements. If you want to look up the courses that UConn offers, the majors, the minors, you name it, it's included in the catalog. There are some important things included in the catalog that I wanted to pull out specifically for this presentation for students transitioning from high school into UConn. Um, and one of those first thing is um, AP or ECE credits. So how does UConn view those? How are those potentially counted towards your degree program? Um, we have a number of students taking advanced placement courses and exams. Um, oftentimes, if students receive a four or higher on the AP exam, they will get credit for a particular course at UConn. Uh, students need to make sure that they um, identify UConn on the College Board website to have those scores sent directly to us. Um, scores are typically sent to the university in the middle of the summer, and so when you're working with your academic advisor, you'll be able to view those credits having come in um, as part of your credit requirements for your overall um, credits needed for graduation. For early college experience, or what we call ECE courses, ECE course is a UConn course. So not only do you earn credit for the class, but you also earn the grade that you've earned pending that grade as a C or higher. The nice thing about ECE classes is that the university does offer students an opportunity to accept or decline those classes by the end of their first semester. Why this is so important is because, say you took um, general biology, we all know bio is a pretty challenging subject and you earned a C, but you are trying to get into the school of pharmacy, which has a GPA requirement and really is looking for B's or higher in their STEM courses. 
you may say, you know what? I don't want to accept that course. I don't want that C to potentially affect my GPA and my chances of getting into pharmacy school. I think I'll just take that course over again. And you're welcome to do that. You're welcome to make the decision to decline that course. The important thing to note is that it's an all or nothing process, right? So you can't just take the credits you've earned for the class and decline the grade. You either take both or you take nothing at all. And you can go over this with your academic advisor as to what the best decision might be for you. And you have until the end of your first semester to decide. We also accept courses from other institutions, so transfer courses. Again, these courses typically need to be a C or higher to come in for credit at the university. And this would go through the Office of Admissions. So um, say before you know you matriculate as a UConn student, you want to take a course at maybe your local community college over the summer, kind of get your feet wet. And once you finish with that class, you'd like to send it to UConn so it can count towards your UConn degree requirements. That's what a transfer course refers to. And so you would have that institution send that class over to UConn to be evaluated. So those are some ways to earn credits before you get to us. The catalog also talks about several different placements. So when we're reviewing students, we want to make sure that you are being put in the class that is the best fit for you. Um, so there is an English placement for all of our incoming students. Um, every student at UConn is responsible for taking a first year writing course. This writing course is required regardless of your school or college, regardless of your major, it is a requirement for graduation. Students will be um, instructed to take the guided placement survey. So if you are joining us this summer um, as part of our new student orientation, you will be directed to take this guided placement um, where we review some of your previous English experience. Um, there's a written portion and it will allow us to give you the proper um, English placement course and, and make the proper recommendation for your course for your first year writing. We also have a math placement. So math placement is different than the English guided placement. So English is a class everyone takes in order to graduate. The math placement is only needed if your major requires pre-calc, calculus one or calculus two as part of your major requirements. Um, if your degree requires a different math class um, outside of calculus or pre-calculus, then you do not need to take the math placement exam. The placement exams online, you take it at home um, on your own time. Um, it is a 33 question exam designed to go over some basic STEM principles to make sure that students have adequate preparation for the math courses. It's not to gauge how much calculus you know, it's just to make sure that you have a solid foundation to be successful in those courses. Students have the opportunity to take the placement exam three times, so you have time to kind of you know, test it out, take it the first time, and if you don't get a qualifying score, you are able to take it again. Um, and there are different scores needed for different classes. This is really important if you have settled on UConn, you are definitely joining us this summer, and you know that your major might potentially require um, pre-calc or calculus that this exam is taken right at the point of signing up for new student orientation. Students cannot enroll in pre-calc or calculus without a qualifying math placement score. So you wouldn't be able to register for that particular math course without a placement, a qualifying placement score on file. And if you go to placement.ucon.edu and you click the math tab, um, you'll be able to see all of the majors listed that um, require pre-calc or calculus so you would know whether you would need to take the placement exam or not. Um, I'll tell you everything in the School of Engineering almost everything in the College of Agriculture, Health and Natural Resources, the School of Pharmacy, um, any of our Bachelor of Science programs, so physical sciences like chemistry, biology, physics, um, physiology and anatomy. Um, that's most of them <laughs> off the top of my head, would require pre -calc or calculus as part of the major, so the math placement exam would be needed. The chemistry placement exam is similar in theory to the math placement exam. Again, not designed to determine how much chemistry you know, but just to make sure that you have a solid foundation to be successful in our chemistry courses. Very similar to the math placement exam, you get three attempts. There's a number of questions. You complete the exam at home at your own pace. And again, the website will review which majors would require general chemistry as part of the major requirements. So again, most majors in the School of Engineering, School of Pharmacy, College of Agriculture, you know, most of our STEM schools and or programs do require chemistry. So you can view the placement website to see 
um, if the major that you are admitted or exploring um, would require you to take the placement exam. Okay, all that fun stuff aside, how do you actually graduate from UConn? So I refer to credits a lot. You need a minimum of 120 credits in order to graduate. Most of our classes are worth three credits, some are worth four, some are worth one or two, but really most classes fall into that three credit range. Students need to take 12 credits or more in order to be full time. This is actually really important if you receive federal financial aid, if you're on any kind of academic or merit scholarship, um, you do typically need to be a full time student. So you'll want to make sure that you're taking 12 credits or more. If we think about it in terms of pure math, Right, you're thinking I go to school for 4 years. That's 8 semesters. If I take 15 credits a semester times 8 semesters, that's 120 credits. So some semesters you might take more than 15. Some you might take less, but it all needs to add up to those 120 credits to graduate. You will need a minimum of a 2.0 cumulative GPA needed for graduation um, and that's starred because. Uh, there are some schools and colleges that do require students to have a higher GPA in order to graduate. Um, the School of Engineering, School of Business um, are some of the ones that come to mind. The classes that you're earning, the credits that you're earning um, are going to fall into one of three categories. So there are general education requirements. So these are your core classes. These are the classes that students need to take to earn that well-rounded liberal arts degree, um, classes that all students need to complete in order to graduate. You will have your major requirements. So if I'm a history major, I will have a list of history classes I must take in order to graduate with a history degree. And then there are electives. Electives are any course that do not meet a major or a general education requirement. So oftentimes students will say to me, I'm a biology major. Why, why would I take this art class? This is not gonna count for anything. Every class counts. Because if you add up the classes you need for your general education requirements, you add up the classes you need for your major, they don't add up to 120 credits. So electives give you the freedom to take courses that you want just to be able to take them. Um, many students will maybe pursue a minor so that the elective courses they're taking kind of are funneled towards something specific. You have the ability to do internships for credit, maybe study abroad and earn credits that way. So think about it as a big piggy bank and we need to fill it with 120 coins. And every time you do a class, you take a requirement, all those coins go into the piggy bank so that you're earning the 120 credits you need to graduate. Earlier when I was referring to AP, ECE, transfer, and you're earning credits, earning credits, those are going towards the 120 credits to graduate. So if you took um, an AP US history and government course, you might have come in with three credits before you even start. So that three credits goes towards the 120 needed for graduation. So that's what I meant when I was referring to credits. To kind of shift gears a little bit, let's talk about the general education requirements. What are they? Why do you need them? Why does everyone have to take them? So really, UConn is a liberal arts institution. When we speak to employers and we say, what are you looking for from our students? No one ever says, you know, I really want a biology major who's only taken 12 bio courses and nothing else. They want a well-rounded student. They want students who are learning, who are challenged outside of their major courses. And if you think about you know, your last few years of high school, how you learn in a biology course is very different than how you learn in an English course, is very different than how you learn in an art course. And so we are challenging our students to be viewing those courses as ways to learn transferable skills, right? Critical thinking skills, teamwork, problem solving, how to um, communicate well, both written and orally. That's what those classes are teaching you. And so oftentimes students will take gen eds purely based on interest, or they will choose general education courses that might be able to complement their degree. So something that kind of goes along with or is parallel to the classes that they're taking for their major. UConn splits up general education requirements into two categories. So the first are competencies, which really focus on skill development. The first thing you might already be coming in with one of our competencies is our second language requirement. So UConn does have a second language requirement. Many students do fulfill this via high school. So if you did three years or more of the same foreign language in high school, you have met UConn's second language competency. It has to be three years or more 
and in the same language. So if you're thinking, oh crap, why did I do two years of French and two years of Latin? This is more than three years, but it's not in the same language. So unfortunately that would not meet the requirement. If you went to a technical high school and they didn't offer a language, um, it's okay to be mad about that right now, but you would just take the language classes while you're at UConn and fulfill the requirement while you're a student. Some students will say, oh, but wait, I only took two years in, in high school, but I did take like seventh and eighth grade. It's up to the third level, which gets a little confusing. So if your high school puts on your transcript that you've met up to the third level, fourth level, oftentimes they do include those um, language courses you've taken in seventh and eighth grade that they're counting that as a level. So when you work with your academic advisor, we'd be able to review that with you and you would know if you met the requirement. And if not, we would help suggest courses that you could take to go ahead and meet that competency. I went over the writing requirement. So our freshman English first year writing course, every student takes. Um, in addition to that course, students will be taking two W or writing intensive courses. So the first year writing course is designed to teach you how to write academically, right? To really focus on the mechanics of academic writing. The W courses are just writing intensive. So taking what you've learned in that academic writing course and applying it to a writing intensive class. It's not necessarily another English class. It could be a political science class. It can be a psychology class. It just means in that particular class, you're gonna do a decent amount of writing. For our quantitative classes or our Q classes, um, you'll take two to three courses depending on your major. Um, anything from like stats and calculus to chemistry and physics, um, as long as it has the Q, it means it has a heavy quantitative component to it. You'll see it says two to three, depending on major. So this is where you, again, wanna make that mental note. What school or college does my major belong to? The College of Liberal Arts and Sciences requires students to take three Q courses. If you're in a STEM major, you're gonna take way more than three Q courses since most of your major is quantitative. But again, it's making that note about what school or college your major potentially belongs to so that you know what requirements you have to meet. We do have a E, um, competency, which is our environmental literacy class. This is just one class that focuses on the interactions between humans and the environment. So maybe something like um, environmental studies, intro to environmental science. Um, like we have an oceanography class. We have a, um, a physics class. Um, so a number of different classes that focus on the interactions um, between humans and the environment. And then lastly, computer technology. So you'll be required to do a technology tutorial and learn about the different technologies that UConn uses prior to um, new student orientation so that you are well aware of how to log in, student administration, SBCT, you know, all of these programs that we use, you wanna become familiar with them before your first semester. And the other part of it is content areas. So really kind of developing that knowledge, developing that well-rounded curriculum that I keep referring to. So content area one is our arts and humanities. So classes like art history, philosophy and social ethics, US history, poetry. Those are all examples of arts and humanities classes. Um, the university requirement is two classes, but again, if your major belongs to the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, you will need additional classes in that area. Two social science classes are required. So um, that could be intro to communications, um, international relations, political science, um, sociology, um, micro and macroeconomics. So those are some examples of our social science classes. Um, content area three is science and technology. So everyone takes at least one laboratory science. So exactly what you'd think, bio, chemistry, physics, um, earth science, something like that. And one non-lab science. So. Um, intro to psychology, um, nutrition, um, linguistics, oceanography. Those are some examples of non-lab science courses. And then lastly is diversity multiculturalism. Two courses from this area as well. One that specifically focuses on diversity internationally and then a second course of your choice. So you're thinking to yourself, oh my God, that's a, how do I do all that? That's a lot of classes. Your gen eds have to be completed by the time you graduate. So usually every semester students will take a couple courses towards their major, a couple gen eds until you've completed the general education courses and then you focus on taking your major and your electives and any other courses you need in order to graduate. So there's really no rush with, with the gen eds. Um, you know, I've had students who are seniors and are dreading, you know, the, the lab science are like, I don't like science, I don't wanna take it, but they take it, they pass it and they're good to graduate. 
So academic advising, every student at UConn is assigned an academic advisor, and that person will be assigned to you depending on how you were admitted to the university. So oftentimes, if you've been admitted directly into your major, you will get um, an advisor who is a representative of that major. So it might be a faculty member or a professional advisor in that particular school or college. If you are an ACES student and you belong to the Academic Center for Exploratory Students, then you will work with one of our exploratory advisors to help support you until you are admitted to your program. We have professional advisors in the advising center. We have um, a professional honors advisor, school of business advisors, um, college of liberal arts advisor, all on the Stanford campus. And then myself and the other advisors in the advising center also support students where their school or college might primarily be at stores. So we would work with you until you campus change to the main campus. So some of the advisors on campus, Raquel, Corey, David, and I all work in the advising center. So if you um, participate in a student orientation over the summer, you'll get to see all of us. Um, we have, like I mentioned, Caitlin in the honors program. Rowan is our student support services coordinator for students admitted to the CAP program. Um, and Megan works with all of our um, College of Liberal Arts students. We also have two professional advisors in the School of Business who um, I've spared by not putting their faces in this presentation, but you can find them on the website. Um, so how does academic advising work? So it is different than what you've experienced in high school um, through your guidance counselor. So oftentimes in high school, it's very, this is what you do. This is what you have to take. Um, here you go. And so it's not quite like that um, at UConn or, or in college. So our job is really to provide you with all of the information that you need to go ahead and make your own academic choices. So we can provide guidance. We can give suggestions. Um, we can review policies and plans of study and all those things with you so that you understand. But at the end of the day, um, it's really important that students understand and accept final responsibility for all of the decisions that you make regarding your academic and graduation requirements. Um, our goal is really to be accessible and honest and really give you all of the information that you need to go ahead and make those decisions. We always, always, always encourage students to um, do their best to make a relationship with their advisor. As a student, you have one advisor. As an advisor, I have 300 students. So introduce yourself, stop into my office, hopefully in the fall and say hi, um, send me an email. Um, we can have meetings like this to introduce ourselves and get to know each other. Um, maintain communication, be proactive. You know, our biggest role at UConn is to be a resource for you and be um, someone who can support you, you know, and guide you on your journey at UConn. So the more you reach out, the more you ask for help, um, the better your experience will often be. We talk with students a lot about their major, about their school or college, about any of their career goals. Um, I mean, really advising is, is all encompassing and we're very happy to have those conversations with students. And we have a resource on our campus called the Major Experience, which is probably one of the best resources that we've ever had and um, ever been able to offer our students. So whether you've been admitted directly into your major and you know exactly what you want to do, or maybe you're considering a couple of different majors, or you're purely exploring and you have no idea yet, you know, the major experience is really a great resource because not only can it help you to explore all of the majors that UConn has, it will connect you with the Center for Career Development to see what you could potentially do with those majors. Um, it will allow you to connect with a student mentor. So I am an animal science major. And I would love to talk to a student in the animal science program at stores to talk about what their experience is like and what animals they're working with and what stores is like. And you can do that through the major experience. You can email students and start a conversation um, and really use them as a resource to learn more about it. Um, it says it's, you know, an exploration tool, and that's also really beneficial for students admitted to their major. I'm admitted to financial management. I know that's what I want to do. So you can use this resource again to explore different career opportunities, maybe different um, minors that can complement your degree. You can reach out to the Center for Career Development to see if there's any kind of internships or job shadow experiences that could potentially um, you could weave into your, your academic program. So um, a really great resource that I encourage all of you to, to check out. 
um, especially those of you who are undecided or exploring one or more majors. Um, this is really helpful, especially if you review this before the point of meeting with an advisor at orientation, because this will just help us give you more resources and more information about some of the things that you've come across on this website or some of the majors that you are interested in or want to discuss. So um, it's just tme.ucon.edu and it's um, available to anybody, student or not. So really, really a great resource. I think that is it for me. Thank you so much for your time and attention. You know, I, I hope all of you are committed and coming and I get to see you over the summer. Um, and we can teach you the Husky cheer and get you excited to, to be on campus with us for this fall. Awesome, Jen, thank you so much for all of your information, all of those incredible tips and tricks that I know have come in so helpful to all of the audience members who just heard them all, maybe for the first time, or maybe, you know, for the second or third, or doesn't hurt. It's such important information. And, you know, at this time, when either you've decided that you're coming to UConn or you're trying to make that decision, it's just so helpful to have all that information in one place. So thank you so much for all of that. Um, we have had some questions come through. We are going to um, start with that. I realized after I introduced or turned it over to Jen to introduce herself that I didn't introduce myself. Um, so my name is Caitlin Roig DeBellis. I am the admissions specialist here at UConn Stanford. I am a UConn alum. I went to UConn stores a really long time ago for both my undergraduate and my graduate studies. Um, I was a NEI graduate. Um, and I'm really passionate about the University of Connecticut. I am an educator and I'm passionate about encouraging students to further their education and, you know, deciding on UConn, in my opinion, is the best choice you could ever make. So um, I would love to get into questions. I know that I saw one come through for Jen specifically. So Jen, um, I was looking at the courses that were offered for my major, and I saw that some of them weren't offered specifically at Stanford. And I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about this. My major is psychology. Sure. So psychology is a major that can be completed in full on the Stanford campus. So I think it gets a little confusing because if you look at the catalog, you will see that there's probably a hundred psychology courses that are um, approved by the University Senate. There are courses that we do offer, have offered, will offer, um, but obviously not every course is offered every semester by every campus. So I think um, you need to understand that you can complete every single major requirement at UConn Stanford. Um, you could potentially, you know, campus change to the source campus. So anything that can be completed at Stanford um, can be completed at the stores campus as well. So um, if there is a particular class that you're very interested in that we don't offer, you may have the opportunity to take it at another campus. Um, oftentimes students who might be interested in a particular um, subject within their major. So for example, if you're interested in psychology and you really want to do like cognitive psychology, neuroscience, you know, some of those classes that we don't particularly offer, um, you might be able to do an independent study or an internship or something like that where you're still gaining that information um, and able to do so via the Stanford campus. Awesome. Thank you, Jen. Um, another question has come through. I will address this one. It is, I was wondering if many students stayed all four of their years at Stanford or if the majority end up transferring to stores. So the first thing I want to clarify is that it is not a transfer. It's a campus change. So we are all Huskies. Once you're a Husky at any of the five UConn campuses, you're a Husky. And what that means is it enables you the option to campus change if you should so choose. So you don't have to, but it's an option that is there and available to you. Um, so the answer to that is it's different every year, the number of students who campus change to stores or any of the other campuses. But I can tell you that there are a large population of students who complete all four years of their studies at UConn Stanford, and they do not campus change at all. The reason for that, there are two reasons that really students decide that UConn Stanford is the place for them and decide that they want to stay. The first is our small class size and our accessibility to learning. Our students teacher ratio is around 17 to one, of course, always in flux, but it is always right around that sweet spot. So it makes it much more comparable to a high school setting than to a college. And so, especially as a freshman student and, as, and a sophomore student, you're not sitting in these large lecture halls with 250, 300 other people like I did at stores, very much a number, very much being spoken at, taking notes and then you know taking a test on it. 
at UConn Stanford, you're in a small class setting, your professor knows you, you are a name, you are a face, you are not a number. Um, when you're in class in that environment, you're actively engaged in your learning, you are an active participant. You're engaged in meaningful discourse, hands-on learning, you know your peers in your class, you're actively participating. Um, and so if that's something that you're looking for, that's definitely something that happens at UConn Stanford. The other thing to note is that when you request office hours with your professor, you're actually meeting with your professor, not a TA or teaching assistant, which is huge for the line of communication. It makes it so much easier for you to be able to go to one person, the direct person, your professor, who's the one grading you, to get the answers to your questions than to have to go, like I did, between two, three, four different TAs to get the answer to a question. So that's one reason students decide to stay at UConn Stanford. The other is our proximity and our location in reference to internships and jobs. We offer over 750 internships. And so as an undergraduate student to get that, to gain that experience, to build your resume is huge. So we have students actually who transfer in from, excuse me, who campus change in from stores um, because they see that as such an incredible opportunity. So the answer to the question is, it's not really a number that we can give, but we have students campus changing in and out, and we have quite a large population of students who complete their studies from start to finish right here with us. Absolutely, um, yeah. exactly. And just to piggyback off what Caitlin said, if the major can be completed in full at Stanford, it's completed in full. That doesn't mean, oh, you might have to take one class at stores or you might have to do something in the summer. You can complete every requirement to earn that degree at Stanford. So for most students who um, are in a major that can be completed at full in full at Stanford, they actually do stay at Stanford the entire four years. Um, it's it's not often we get many students who can complete their degree at Stanford and who choose to move you know, on to stores at some point in their academic career. For other majors, then yes, it, you, would need to, you would need to transition and campus change to the main campus. And that is all dependent on the school or college that you belong to. And there's a lot of kind of policies and rules that go along with, with campus changing. Um, but ultimately, you know, we will support our students to make sure that they are, you know, on a timely degree progression and that they are campus changing when they need to back based on what they've completed academically. Right, absolutely. Um, the next question, I'm going to give the broad answer and then open it to Jen if she wants to add anything because she would be the expert. So the question is, as a transfer student, when will I be assigned and given a time to meet with my advisor? So the easy answer to that is once you decide to be a Yukon Husky at Stanford, you're gonna pay your deposit in your student portal, and then you're going to receive information from the orientation office about signing up for your sessions. And one of the most important key components of orientation is your academic advising session, which is when you will meet with your academic advisor for the first time. But I'm not sure if Jen has anything to add to that about specifically that very first advising session for a transfer. Sure. So it's, it's a little different. So I, I, I see the question. So you your initial meeting will be over the summer via new student orientation and you will be meeting with an academic advisor. We do our best to um, try to have the advisor you meet with over the summer continue to be your academic advisor into the fall semester. It doesn't always work that way because oftentimes um, you know, as a smaller campus, we wear many hats. So while we will support you over the summer, you may be assigned to somebody else, either in your department or in your school or college um, as the fall approaches. So for summer, you work with an advisor as part of orientation, and then every new student is assigned their official academic advisor, usually by the 10th day of the semester. We try to make that person the same person just for continuity and for you to develop that relationship doesn't always work out that way. So just something to know, but you will have a summer advisor and then you will have an official assigned advisor by the 10th day of the semester. Awesome. Um, the next question. So can we go over the stores spring admissions program? So spring into stores. Um, I was admitted into that. So I can share that the Spring into Stores program. So for those of you who may be listening and you want to know what that is, um, students, some students are admitted their first semester to Stanford and then they spring into stores for their um, spring semester of their freshman year. Um, it is a highly competitive program that a select group of students are accepted into because the committee has decided that they want to see a bit more academically speaking from them as a UConn student. So starting that one semester at that regional campus, but then springboarding into stores for the spring semester. So typically a student has to complete 54 credits with us at Stanford before being able to campus change. And so that why that is why it is a more competitive 
um, program being accepted into that through admissions because you're able to go sooner, right? Almost a year and a half sooner. Um, I'm not sure if Jen has anything to add about that specific program from the advising mm -hmm. standpoint. Of sure, what so advising wise, nothing changes. We would work with you over the summer to take the courses you need for your fall semester, depending on your admitted or exploring major. Students do need to be full time, so you do need to have 12 credits or more in your first semester and earn a 3.0 GPA or higher to remain eligible for the spring into stores program. So to remain eligible to campus change to stores for the spring program. Once you campus change to stores, you will be assigned a new academic advisor and you will be working with that person on the stores campus. Um, we would support you in Stanford in terms of um, giving you the information you need to campus change. Um, providing you with information regarding like changing your financial aid and your housing and, and all of that stuff. Um, but otherwise, nothing else really changes. You know, like Caitlin mentioned before, we're all one Yukon. So the processes of enrolling in classes and all those things, it's all the same. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, the next question is, I was accepted into the ACES program. Um, however, I have appealed that decision. When, you know, when and how will I find out? So a few things on that um, from an admission standpoint. So I'm not sure what you put on your application, but typically um, it sounds like you didn't put ACES. Um, so typically a student being accepted into ACES and not choosing to be put there, it is because you have applied into one of our most competitive majors. So at UConn, not just UConn, Stanford, at UConn, we have three schools that are our most competitive. Those being engineering, business, and nursing. And so if you have applied into one of those schools or a major underneath the umbrella of one of those schools, oftentimes the committee, the admissions committee, might want to see more from you academically speaking before accepting you into that really competitive, challenging major. Um, so what that means is they see you as a very valid candidate for UConn, and so they accept you into ACES, Academic Center for Exploratory Students, which is essentially undecided. And what happens is you work with your academic advisor to really take those core classes to get very strong scores in the maths and sciences specifically, and then you would work to apply into that competitive major with your academic advisor as a student. And that's the part where it goes into Jen's world of advising. So, you know, what more can you tell us about that process of applying into a major as a student? Not sure. So, you know, the application process really varies depending on school or college. But the 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 best news is that whether you are admitted or whether you are exploring, you are taking the same curriculum. So I've been admitted to civil engineering. Caitlin applied to engineering and was put into ACES. Our first semester courses are exactly the same. Um, same thing with School of Business. For School of Nursing, for the most part, there are a couple of nursing classes that are limited specifically to students admitted to that program. But if a student is admitted down the line, they would be able to catch up with those classes later in their program. Um, some of the other uh, competitive majors. So yeah, everything in, in um, engineering, business, um, if you're admitted to pharmacy studies or if you're thinking about exploring pharmacy, that is another competitive program. So basically everything outside of the College of Global Arts and Sciences are um, prof considered professional schools. So they are majors that you have to apply and be admitted to. But for almost all of those programs, the curriculum that you would take within your first year or maybe more is exactly the same as an admitted student. So like Caitlin said, some students meet the academic criteria right out of high school. Some students need to take the academic courses at UConn to prove they meet the academic criteria as a UConn student. Right, right. Awesome, thank you for adding that, Jen. Sure. Um, the next one I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna answer the broad answer and then I'm gonna defer to Jen to add on any information she knows about that specific to advising. So the question is, um, I am transferring into UConn Stanford. Can I take a summer math class at stores this summer? And so the answer to that is yes, you can. Um, and every semester you are able as a UConn student to take a certain number of credits at one of the other campuses, but I personally am unaware of what that number is, Jen. <laughs> So summer, you can take at any campus that is not, no matter what campus you're admitted to, you can take a summer class from any UConn campus. It goes on your transcript and nothing is, is um, notated by campus. So it's not like your, your transcript says taken at UConn Stanford, taken at UConn stores. Again, all one UConn. Um, during a regular semester, so fall or spring semester, you have to take the majority of your classes at your home campus. So majority meaning say I'm taking five classes, Three of those classes have to be at UConn Stanford. 
but maybe you want to take one class at Waterbury or one class at Hartford and then the rest of your classes at Stanford. It would be kind of a crazy commute, but you are more than welcome to do that and you are allowed to do that. This is all based on the fee per campus, right? What tuition costs per campus, what fees are associated per campus, which is why you need to make sure that you are properly enrolled at your home campus. Otherwise, you have the potential of it affecting your bill and your aid and all of those things that you don't want to get into. Awesome. Um, the next question that just came through, um, I'm going to sort of synthesize it, but the student is wondering that he is a transfer student and wants to know if he um, should be signing up for his classes now or if he has to wait to orientation because his friends who are students now are signing up. So the long and short of that is that, yes, students who are current students are signing up for you know, either are, have started already or are in the process of signing up for their classes because they are current students. If you are an incoming student, either first year or transfer, you will be signing up for your classes during the orientation session when you meet with your academic advisor, which, yes, will be over the summer months. And I believe, Jen, it's June through early August orientation. Correct. Correct. Right. Um, so don't worry that you're not signing up now. That is the process. So next year, when you are a current student, you will be signing up earlier. Um, so that you're aware for next year when your sign up will be happening. The next one I'm going to completely give to Jen, the next question <laughs> that has come in. Um, it is, will we have a different advisor if we go on to proclaim as a pre-med major? Okay, so there is no pre-med major. <laughs> I wanted you to so, say it. Yeah. So pre-med is, um, think about it as a track, right? So it's a list of classes that students take to make sure that they are prepared to take the MCAT exam. Um, you can be any major you want to, as long as you are taking that list of prerequisite courses to take the MCAT exam. I've had students be history students. I've had students be physics students, psych students, you name it. You can literally major in anything that you want to, as long as you're taking the prerequisite courses. Um, many students are under the impression that I want to be pre-med, so I should be doing biology or I should be doing chemistry or anatomy. It's actually the opposite. Um, if you think about everyone applying to medical school as a biology major, what makes you different? What makes you stand out? If you're all the same and so they actually prefer students who are learning skills outside of their stem courses they like philosophy students they like psychology or human development students you know learning how people think and act and behave and learning that bedside manner um so really you can major in anything so we do have a pre-med advising office where you can talk about you know the courses um, maybe sign up for like an MCAT prep exam, you know, get to know other students who might be interested in pre-med, but it's not a major. So you wouldn't actually be assigned a particular advisor in, in that area, but you could work with the advising office um, for any questions that you might have. Mm -hmm. And that's such a great point, Jen, that we share a lot in the admissions office with either accepted students or prospective students who are so set on one major because they believe that it's the only way to get to a career and not just pre-med and you know being in the medical field. You know, there are many different careers where you know students believe that they have to have one major to attain that. And really, you know, there's so many different ways to get to a very, you know, various career paths. You know, I'll use myself as an example. So I have my master's in education. And while I'm very much an educator, two of the hats that I wear in my professional life have nothing to do with education. I'm the executive director of a nonprofit, nothing really to do, you know, that's that's not because I have an education degree. Um, and, you know, I also um, sort of, in my in my free time, um, I do a lot of professional speaking, which typically you would think of, okay, communications would have been my major. So it's very, very true. I know it might not sound like it when you're 17 and 18 and you're so set on one career and one path, but there are many ways to get to your desired career field. So be open, take courses that interest you and challenge yourself. Um, because again, on your resume, that is what your employers are going to be looking for, um, for sure. Um, some other questions have come in. Let's see here. Which ones are the new ones? Um, okay. Um, this one just came in. So do you have any specific advice for someone who hopes to go to law school in the future? So 
I'll start and then I'll just, I'll hand it over to Jen as she probably has much more specific advice, but piggybacking on, you know, sort of what I just shared, um, making sure that you're challenging yourself in the courses you're taking and the depth and breadth of courses that you're taking and that you're not taking all political science classes or all, you know, we don't really have all the criminal justice classes, but all criminal justice classes, right? That you're, you know, varying the courses that you're taking and that you're, you know, really showing resume wise that you've challenged yourself um, and that you've done things that are they're varied and different right because that's how you get experience and that's what future employers are really looking for um but specifically in terms of advising jen what do you advise yeah so, you know pre-law falls into the same boat as pre-med right so it's not a major um, it's not even a track of courses. So really, you know, what, what pre-law is designed to do or what they want students to be considering is taking classes that will help prepare you for the LSATs. And these are not law-related classes. These are classes that really help students in their problem-solving, critical thinking skills. So classes like, um, like we have a problem-solving math class or a philosophy and logic or creative writing, um, any kind of research class, um, public speaking courses, um, anthropology courses, so courses that are really going to challenge the way that you think. Um, but again, there's no, you know, you don't want every law student to be a philosophy major or a history major or a political science major because that doesn't differentiate you. They actually want someone who's maybe a physics major who is approaching the law in a completely different way based on the way they've been trained and the way that they've processed information. So, um, you know, there's a, a list on UConn's website if you go to prelaw.uconn.edu, which will give you some helpful classes that you can take to help prepare you for the LSAT. But again, there's no particular major um, that really is better than any other major and making sure that you are prepared you know, for the, the law school entrance exam. Great advice. Um, a question has come through and it's a, I'm not exactly sure what it's asking. So please use that question box if you want to add to the question after I've addressed what I think you're asking. So in terms of the spring into stores program, how do you make sure that we achieve the 54 credits? So the spring into stores program is actually a program that is designed for the students admitted into it. They complete one semester with us at Stanford. So the fall semester of their freshman year, and then they spring into stores for their spring semester. So they're only completing at Stanford with us, you know, 12 to 18 credits typically um, that first semester. And then they're seamlessly campus changing up to stores. The 54 credits, that applies to students who are accepted to UConn Stanford, but would like to campus change later on in their career. So they're two separate things. The 54 credits, that's that magic number, sort of that golden number um, that you need to achieve before campus changing if you have just been accepted to UConn Stanford in a standard acceptance, not the spring into stores. So hopefully that addresses what you were asking there. But if not, please, you know, add into the box and we will address address what the question is. OK, great. So that addressed the question. <laughs> um, so I'm not seeing any other questions coming through. I do want to. I think I see a couple. Caitlin, I'm sorry. I, I don't know if they were just sent to me. OK, um, let me see. School of Business and the math placement exam. So technically, no, you do not need it. So even though you are required to take a class called Math 1071Q, which is Calculus for Business and Economics, that class is not um, under the list of classes that need the math placement exam. So while it may be recommended to take it, just to kind of gauge where your foundation lies, um, there is no hard hold in our system. So um, unlike calculus and pre-calculus, if you don't have a qualifying score and you go on the computer to enroll in that class, you will not be allowed to enroll. Um, that is not the case with Math 1071, which is a requirement for business. Right. I did not have a question. So I have did not have that one. Do you have other ones, Jen, that maybe were just um, I'm double checking to see if there's anything for pre-med. I got that one. Screen into stores, I got that one. Calc. Um just confirming I don't need to worry about classes later in the summer because I'm a transfer. Okay, yeah. So um no, because we we do keep a very close eye on course availability and making sure that we still have a significant number of courses and classes that are available for students signing up over the summer. So we do a few things. Sometimes we will um, hold classes and we don't open them until orientation so that there are seats available for new students. Um 
Oftentimes transfer students are looking for upper level courses, which are not typically filled, you know, by current students who are enrolling. Um, you know, we really encourage you to sign up for the earliest orientation date available to you. The earlier you sign up, the more courses that are available. So those are all things that um, ways that you can kind of combat worrying about, um, you know, course availability and some of the courses that you might be taking. Um, I had a question come through here to our main one. Um, how and when will we fill out housing and meal plans? So the housing application, the deadline. So first and foremost, not advising nor admissions. We neither of us are res life, but we're happy to share with you what we know. Um, so the residential life office for their uh, housing application, the deadline was April 1st. So it's passed by almost a week now. Um, I don't know, you know, what that means. If there are, you know, are is flexibility with that. So you would want to call them directly. Um, I'd be happy to give you their number. I have it right here. So the direct number for Res Life is going to be 860-486-2926. Um, that is the number at stores. The stores office handles all of stores housing and all of Stanford. Stanford is the only regional campus with housing. And so you'd want to reach out to them directly and really ask that question. And then in terms of a meal plan, so at UConn Stanford, we don't have a traditional meal plan, which I actually think is a huge bonus for our students. Our students cook for themselves. Every single one of our apartments or dorms um, are actually apartments, luxury apartments. They were built for young professionals, not for students. UConn saw the opportunity purchase them and now our students get the you know pleasure of living in them they're absolutely beautiful granite county nicer than any apartment caitlin and i have ever lived in in the first you know 10 years of our college career <laughs> they're absolutely beautiful um and so you know because every single unit has their own kitchen with granite countertops and stainless steel appliances our students cook for themselves we do have some viable options. We have our Yukon Cafe on campus. Our bookstore carries a ton of grab and go items. Um, and then of course, with your Husky One card, most of the re local restaurants in Stanford specifically will offer you a discount. So there's a ton of options, but we do not have a traditional dining hall with a meal plan like many students are accustomed to. So that's just something important to note. Um, let's take a look here. So those were the only questions that I had that have come through. Jen, get any more? Sorry, my kids are home. It's about to get real. <laughs> Same. <laughs> Same, but hence, hence the reality we've all been living in for 13 months. So we do the best we can. Um, oh, here, one more question has come through. Do you know if we create our UConn emails during orientation? Yes, that is part, that is on your checklist to create your email on the orientation checklist. But I believe, Jen, that you're supposed to create it by yourself prior to actually attending. Yes, so you will have um, a technology kind of checklist that you will complete um, once you are once you sign up for orientation. You're going to go through a checklist of the things that you need to do, um, and signing up for your UConn email is one of those things. We do encourage you, please, if you get nothing out of this presentation, your UConn email is one of the most important things. Everything that we send to you is coming to your UConn email. Oftentimes, students forget. That their personal email is linked with their high school and that gets deactivated after you graduate so we don't have a personal email for you we're only able to contact you via UConn email and once orientation is over and you are a fully matriculated student we only email your UConn email it is the most important way um, that we communicate with our students so once you are admitted to the university you've paid your deposit usually after about three to five business days everything kicks in and you are able to um, activate your UConn email and I will just reiterate that one more time. If you have attended our admitted next steps, now what session, you will know that one of the key components that we focus on is your email and checking it regularly and often. We suggest an admissions starting out one time of day, picking the time and checking it every single day at that time. It is that important. If you miss something, it might be the difference between completing orientation that's mandatory or not. And if you don't complete orientation that's mandatory, that means you are not entering as a UConn student. So check your email, make sure you're on top of all of them. If you have questions, reach out for clarification, but check your email daily. And if you're not doing that already, start today. 
start today. Um, the last question, because it is five o'clock and we are going to wrap up, but one last question came in. We did go over this, but to reiterate, we want to make sure you have all the information. When will orientation be? Um, so orientation runs, you know, end of May through very beginning of August. And you will, once you pay your deposit within your student portal, you will get emails um, about signing up for orientation. And as Jen shared, you know, if you are really excited to sign up for your classes, sign up for the first available session that you possibly can, because that means you'll get to your academic advising appointment sooner. I don't Absolutely, know. we have 11 freshman orientation dates, most of them in the month of June. So plenty and plenty of opportunity for students to be able to sign up.